Hello. Good afternoon and welcome to today's session. I want to say thanks to those who are also joining us live in Vegas this week. It's great to see some people in person again. Uh, my name is Andrew Kutze, and I'm joined here today by two people. This is uh, Jesse Felix. Jesse and I are product managers with Amazon S3. And we also have the pleasure of being joined today on stage by Srini Boba. Uh, Srini is a principal product manager with Splunk, and in just a little bit, will talk to us about how Splunk uses S3 to manage hundreds of petabytes of data. So today, we'll be talking about uh, S3 storage classes, how customers with different patterns of cost optimization use S3 to optimize their cost. We'll then double click and deep dive specifically on the S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval Storage class we announced earlier this week as well as the new access tier in S3 Intelligent Tiering. Uh, we'll then pass the mic off to Srini, who will talk to us about how Splunk uses S3 to manage hundreds of petabytes of data that is queried by thousands of users around the globe. And we'll save the last five or so minutes for any Q&A just off stage. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to say thank you. Thanks to those in the room, and thanks to the many millions of customers who use S3 today. What I find particularly fascinating about this image is really the breadth and the depth of storage use cases and how these use cases have evolved over time. When Amazon S3 launched in 2006, one of the top use cases was website hosting. But today, we see customers of all sizes across every industry running every imaginable workload on Amazon S3. And these use cases span from running data lakes to storing data that is used for machine learning, content delivery, and medical research. And the reason for this is because Amazon S3 provides industry-leading performance. Easy to use management features to manage your storage. In fact, S3 is the only cloud storage service that lets you manage your data at the object, bucket, and account level. For example, you can use S3 storage lens to view your object storage usage with drill downs to the account and prefix levels. Uh, S3 provides the most data movement options and the widest range of cost optimization capabilities, including S3 Glacier Deep Archive, which delivers the lowest cost storage in the cloud. And lastly, S3 provides industry-leading scalability, availability, and durability. And this is because of S3's multi-availability zone or multi-AZ resiliency model. So by default, S3 storage classes redundantly store data across a minimum of three physically separated AWS availability zones in a single region. These availability zones have independent power, cooling, and uh, networking, and are connected via ultra-low latency networks. Furthermore, these availability zones are never in the same physical building. They're in separate facilities that are separated by many kilometers. So this kind of built-in redundancy is really transformational to those businesses that are used to operating in a single on-premises data center, or perhaps a second for disaster recovery. And building on top of S3's industry-leading scalability, availability, security, and performance, I'm really excited about today's session because I get to talk to all of you about some of the ways that you can fundamentally redefine cost optimization with S3. In particular, I want to highlight two announcements from earlier this week that I think redefine cost optimization and archiving your data with S3. The first is Amazon S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval. This is a new storage class that delivers the lowest cost storage in the cloud for long-lived, rarely accessed data that requires milliseconds retrieval. It delivers the same latency and throughput performance as the S3 standard and the S3 standard infrequent access storage classes. And like S3 standard infrequent access, it's designed for 99.9% .9 availability with 11 ninth of data durability by redundantly storing data across a minimum of three physically separated AWS availability zones. And it's really easy to get started with S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval. You can upload data directly to the storage class, or you can use S3 lifecycle policies to move your data from the S3 standard or the S3 standard infrequent access storage classes into S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval. And second, with the launch of S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval, we're also introducing a new access tier into the S3 Intelligent Tiering storage class. And so S3 Intelligent Tiering uh, delivers automatic storage cost savings by monitoring data at the granular object level and moving objects to lower cost access tiers. It's really the ideal use case, or the real ideal storage class, sorry, for data that has unknown or changing access patterns. It will spend the latter half of today's session diving really deep into intelligent tiering. So if you have data that requires instant access to storage and you have unknown or unpredictable access patterns, you can receive the same storage price as the S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval Storage class with this new access tier in S3 Intelligent Tiering. So now I want to take a step back and I want to talk a little bit about why we built S3 Glacier Instant, Instant Retrieval as well as the new access tier in S3 Intelligent Tiering. 
So in the same ways that customers have evolved their storage use cases over time, we've absolutely seen that customers have evolved in the way that they optimize cost. We like to call these patterns of cost optimization. Today, we see two broad stroke patterns of cost optimization. The first is data with known or predictable access patterns. Do you have data that becomes infrequently accessed after a definitive period of time? Let's take, for example, user-generated content like videos and photos that we share with our friends and family. That content is frequently accessed right after we upload it, but becomes rarely accessed after a few weeks or perhaps after a few days. For use cases like these, many of our customers know when data becomes infrequently accessed and can pinpoint the right exact moment to move their data from a storage class that is really cost optimized for frequent access storage to one that is cost optimized for infrequent access of storage. But what if you have data with unknown or changing access patterns? For use cases like storing shared data sets where data is accessed by several different applications, it's really common that many users within an organization will access S3 with different tools. These access patterns are highly variable over the course of the year and really range from no access to being accessed multiple times in a single month or perhaps even in a single day, which could result in higher retrieval charges if stored in a storage class that is cost optimized for infrequent access to storage or one for archive access. In fact, I'd say that the vast majority of data today has unknown, changing, or unpredictable access patterns. I think that use cases like data lakes and analytics are really good examples uh, of storage that has unknown access patterns and that this is virtually applicable across every single industry. But let's take another example of public research data that is available to scientists and economists and includes weather pattern data, economic data, uh, and driving data. Oftentimes, it's very common that these data sets are rarely accessed for very long periods of time, but unforeseen, unforeseen world events could drive a surge in demand, uh, and customers will want to frequently access this type of storage. Some examples of use cases that have known or predictable access patterns include medical imaging, for example. Um, it's, it's very common that healthcare providers uh, would store medical images in a frequent access storage class for a period of time, but after a few weeks, move that storage to one that is designed for archive storage. Um, perhaps a more relatable example, again, is any sort of user-generated content. I'm sure many of us in the room uh, use a photo sharing site for, stor uh, for storing photographs that we expect to treasure forever. Um, once we upload a photograph, we may share it, and it would then get downloaded a few times, but that content likely sees a uh, major decline in access frequency after a few weeks. So if you have one of these use cases where data becomes rarely accessed after a definitive period of time, using S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval allows you to lower your storage costs. And this becomes increasingly important, I think, for customers across virtually every industry that are accumulating petabytes of data, including medical records, news broadcasting assets, user-generated content, genomic data, um, where that data must be highly available and immediately accessible, but is rarely accessed. And this is really just a few times a year, and we'll dive into that here shortly. Now, let's see where S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval fits in with the S3 storage classes. It's really important to choose a storage class that best matches your workload requirements and really how you want to use your data. So in order to support these patterns of cost optimization we just discussed, S3 has a number of storage classes to choose from and for virtually every imaginable use case. So in the following, we're going to talk about how you can match your access pattern, whether it be known or unknown, with the right S3 storage class. Well, since the launch of Amazon S3 in 2006, we've not only decreased pricing, but we've accelerated innovation by introducing new storage classes that allow you to optimize your costs based on the requirements of your workload. For example, in 2019, we introduced S3 Glacier Deep Archive, which delivers the lowest cost storage in the cloud. Earlier this week, we introduced S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval, which delivers the fastest access to low-cost archive storage. A few years ago, we launched S3 Intelligent Tiering, a storage class that delivers automatic storage cost savings based on the changing access patterns of your workload. And because the vast majority of data has unknown, changing, or unpredictable access patterns, many of our customers use the S3 intelligent tiering storage class to automatically optimize their cost. S3 Intelligent Tearing is the first cloud storage class that delivers automatic storage cost savings by monitoring your data at the granular object level 
and moving objects that have not been accessed to lower cost access tiers. Customers use S3 intelligent tiering to store their shared data sets, where data is aggregated and accessed by different applications, teams, and individuals, whether that's used for analytics, machine learning, real-time monitoring, or other data lake use cases. And I want to highlight here that S3 intelligent tiering is really becoming the standard or the default storage class for many of our customers, particularly those that are running data lakes on Amazon S3. And for data that has known or predictable access patterns, you could choose from a set of storage classes that are cost optimized for different data access patterns. So S3 standard is the ideal storage class for frequently accessed data. This is really the best choice if you're accessing your data more than once a month. S3 standard is also the ideal storage class for small, short-lived objects. And so S3 standard infrequent access in the storage classes to follow are designed for less frequently accessed workloads, where your cost of store data decreases, but the cost to access your data moderately increases. S3 standard infrequent access is the ideal storage class for data that is accessed about once every month or two. S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval is the ideal storage class for data that is accessed once a quarter. And for archived data that does not require immediate access, S3 Glacier Flexible Retrieval delivers additional cost savings with the retrieval times of minutes to hours. And earlier this week, we also announced that bulk retrievals in the S3 Glacier Flexible Retrieval storage class are now free. And lastly, S3 Glacier Deep Archive delivers the lowest cost storage in the cloud with re uh, data retrieval within hours. Additionally, S3 offers a, a set of storage classes for very specialized workloads. Uh, so for easily recreatable data or uh, for storing a secondary copy in a different region, uh, you can use the S3 One Zone Infrequent Access Storage class, which delivers additional cost savings over S3 Standard Infrequent Access, but stores data in a single availability zone. Uh, and lastly, S3 on Outpost uh, delivers object storage to your on-premises environment with the S3 API and the capabilities of that, uh, AWS that you use today. So now that we've talked about the number of storage classes you can choose from to match, the, to match your access pattern, um, I want to dive a little bit deeper into S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval and talk about the economics, when to use it, and how to use it. So in, value, in evaluating when you should use S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval, there are really two factors to consider. The first is the frequency of access, and the second is the duration of storage. So S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval Instant Retrieval is really the ideal storage class if you access your data uh, once per quarter. That's because although the storage price is lower than the S3 standard infrequent access storage class, the, co the cost to access your data is moderately higher, which means that there's effectively a break-even point where if you're storing data that is accessed too frequently, it would make sense to keep that data in S3 standard infrequent access or the S3 standard storage class. Uh, in addition, S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval has a minimum storage duration of 90 days. So let's say you upload a file that you expect to delete within 90 days, we'd recommend uh, writing to S3 Standard or S3 Standard Infrequent Access. And keep in mind here that S3 Standard Infrequent Access also has a minimum storage duration of 30 days. There are a few very simple ways uh, to get started with S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval. First, you can specify Glacier underscore IR uh, in the put API request header to write objects directly into the storage class. Uh, customers should upload directly into the storage class if you know that your data is rarely accessed right at the point of ingest. Uh, or you can also use S3 lifecycle policies to move data with predictable access patterns to lower cost storage classes. Remember that S3 standard, standard infrequent access, as well as S3 Glacier instant retrieval deliver milliseconds access to storage whereas the S3 Glacier Flexible Retrieval and S3 Glacier Deep Archive storage classes are designed for asynchronous access to storage with retrieval times of minutes to hours. S3 lifecycle policies are rules you can set up to move objects to another storage class after a given number of days. Uh, these rules are based on the creation date of the object and can be set at the whole bucket, a prefix, or just the tagged object, objects. Let's take, for example, a really typical medical imaging workload. When an image uh, is generated, it's typically frequently accessed for a short period of time by the radiologist, the practicing physician, the technicians. After a period of time, that image is likely rarely ever accessed again, perhaps for a patient visit or if a radiologist needs to review a patient's prior history. But when they want to get their data back, they need it immediately. Uh, you know, in this uh, example right here, you can move your data from the S3 standard storage class to S3 standard uh, Glacier Instant Retrieval, sorry, S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval after a period of time. 
and then further optimize your cost by moving that data to the S3 Glacier Deep Archive Storage class. So we just walked through a hypothetical scenario uh, where a customer with a medical imaging workload uses a range of storage classes, including S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval, to hit the right balance of cost and performance. Here's a quote from Intellirad. Intellirad is a medical imaging software provider that serves over 300 healthcare organizations around the world, such as hospitals, radiology groups, and imaging centers. Intellirad will use S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval to reliably store medical images for their customers for very long periods of time and still deliver instant access to these images. Quotes like this really excite me because they highlight how customers will use a set of storage classes to optimize their cost. Another very common use case uh, that we're going to see with S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval is really any form of a media archive or content library. So in this particular example, it's NASCAR using S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval to optimize their cost. Media archives, uh, you know, regardless of the, if they contain sports highlights or any sort of historical news programming, are, are typically stored in perpetuity uh, and must always be immediately accessible so that producers and editors can act quickly in the event of something like a breaking news cycle. You know, as these media archives grow exponentially in size, uh, it's, it's really important to continuously optimize costs. S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval lets customers optimize their storage costs for these rarely accessed archives and still be able to access their content quickly. Next, we'll deep dive into S3 Intelligent Tiering and the new access tier we announced earlier this week. Um, very quickly, by a show of hands, how many of, how many of you use intelligent tiering today? The lights are, but I see several hands going up. Well, one of the things that Andrew was talking, talking about was that intelligent tiering is the only storage class that optimizes at the granular object level based on your changing access patterns. And in fact, since the launch of S3 intelligent tiering in 2018, Customer storage cost savings now exceed a total of 200, oh, $250 million in savings that we have passed on and uh, back to customers. When we look at a number like that, we actually get really excited about the savings that we have delivered to our customers since the launch, since the launch of Intelligent Tearing. In particular, we know that passing on this value back to you uh, enables you to build better products and new product experiences that ultimately help you grow your business. So let's talk more about what is S3 Intelligent Tiering and when exactly should we use it. Intelligent Tiering is a storage class that automatically optimizes storage cost whenever your data access patterns change. And when, with the introduction of the new Archive Instant Access Tier, Intelligent Tiering now automatically optimizes storage cost between three access tiers. With the new Archive Instant Access tier, Intelligent Tiering now automatically delivers 68% in storage cost savings compared to the Infrequent Access tier. And with, the, and with this introduction of the Archive Instant Access tier, there's absolutely no impact on performance. So the Frequent Access, Infrequent Access, and the new Archive Instant Access tier have the exact same performance. We'll talk a little bit more later about exactly how it works. Uh, overall, Intelligent Tiering is designed for 3 ninths of availability and 11 ninths of durability. Let's talk a little bit about when exactly should you think about using S3 Intelligent Tiering. One of the things that Andrew talked about is that Intelligent Tiering is ideal for workloads that have unpredictable access patterns. So what does that mean? So I talk to a lot of customers that tell me I have subsets of data that appear to be infrequently accessed or rarely accessed at very specific points in time, but I don't know how that, the data access will change in the future. Take, for example, many BI workflows. You have data that uh, you can query by different users within your organization via tools like Athena or Redshift, uh, Spectrum, or even Amazon QuickSight. Different users across your organization, whether it be finance or business analysts or data scientists, will access different data sets at different times. Because you don't know when data access patterns will change in the future, it is ideal that you use Intelligent Tiering for these workflows. Intelligent Tiering will automatically manage the cost optimization between access tiers without you having to do anything. And in addition, uh, you have optional asynchronous ar archive uh, access tiers if you want to achieve the lowest storage cost in the cloud 
for data that is not accessed for a very long period of time. So before the introduction of the archive instant access tier, the way that intelligent terrain worked was that you would pay, you, you pay a, per, a small per object monitoring and automation charge and intelligent tiering keeps tracks the access of every single object that you store in intelligent tiering. After 30 days of consecutive no access, intelligent tiering automatically moves those objects to the infrequent access tier. If they're later accessed, they move back to the frequent access tier. And when your data access patterns change, there's absolutely no retrieval fees and there's no impact on performance. And now with the introduction of the new archive instant access tier, intelligent tiering automatically optimizes between three access tiers. Similar to, similar to the, the, what I just explained, any objects uh, uploaded or transitioned to intelligent tiering are, are automatically stored in the frequent access tier. After 30 days of consecutive no access, you get 40% storage cost savings on those objects compared to the uh, frequent access tier. And now any objects that are not accessed for 90 consecutive days, you get 68% in storage cost savings on that data relative to the infrequent access tier. Now, for the folks that raised their hands, you might be asking yourself, what does this mean to me? It's a fair question. So over the next coming of days, or the next coming days, in fact, probably today or tomorrow, you should be looking at your cost explorer reports, and you should see meaningful storage cost savings for many objects that have not been accessed for 90 consecutive days. And the key thing that I want to emphasize is that there's absolutely no impact on performance, uh, and there's nothing that you need to do differently than you were doing already. We built the archive instant access tier within the intelligent tiering storage class because many of our customers told us that they have petabytes of data that are stored in the intelligent tiering storage class within the infrequent access tier that are rarely accessed and need to be immediately retrievable. So for a lot of these customers, that means that they cannot move this data to the asynchronous access tier, so they always have to be, to be uh, immediately accessible. One example of this is that we have a lot of customers within intelligent tiering that manage different data platforms for log analytics, web analytics, vehicle data analytics, and even meteorological data that's made available over the internet. Whenever end users want to access this data, it has to be immediately accessible when it is called. A quick recap on the uh, intelligent tiering that we just talked about. So now intelligent tiering automatically optimizes storage costs between three access tiers. There's absolutely nothing that you have to do. It's not an opt-in feature. We are, we're automatically optimizing any objects that are rarely accessed or not accessed for 90 consecutive days into the new archive instant access tier, where you get 68% lower storage costs relative to the infrequent access tier. And with these changes, there's no impact on performance, and there's no changes to the availability or the durability of intelligent tiering. Intelligent tiering is designed for three nines of availability and 11, 11 nines of durability. I want to call attention to two other pricing innovations that we recently launched within the intelligent tiering storage class. First, any objects that are smaller than 128 kilobytes that are not eligible for auto tiering within the intelligent tiering storage class are not monitored or charged. Second, if you have any workflows, staging workflows, where you delete data within the first 30 days, uh, these workflows will not incur early delete charges within the intelligent tiering storage class. Intelligent tiering no longer has a storage stor duration uh, minimum period. So why did we do this? Many of our customers told us that they're increasingly using intelligent tiering as their default storage class for data, anal data analytics and data lake use cases and they don't want to have to analyze their object size distribution, for example. They don't want to have to analyze the different lifespans of different objects. And now with these changes, customers can use intelligent tiering for these workflows with, without incurring any additional operational overhead. And with the increasing number of customers that are using intelligent tiering as their default storage class, I increasingly get asked, what is the most cost-effective way to upload uh, to intelligent tiering? One of the things that I want to highlight is that you can directly upload your data to intelligent tiering by, ch by changing the uh, put API request header and specifying intelligent tiering as a default storage class. And this will ensure that any newly created objects are automatically uploaded to the intelligent tiering storage class. So 
the simplicity of S3 intelligent tiering, it really, really resonates with our customers. And in our short history, since 2018, we have delivered various innovations within the intelligent tiering storage class that continue to deliver value to, our, d d deliver value to you without you having to do uh, any, anything um, else and adding any operational overhead. To give you just a few examples, shortly after launching in uh, 2018, we added support for the, the, the access tiers of the intelligent tiering within the inventory reports. And the reason why we launched that is because customers wanted to know which objects were sitting in the infrequent access tier, let's say, for a very long time, or the rarely accessed tier for a very long time. And we also launched the asynchronous archive ac access tiers because many of our customers told us that, hey, if data's not being accessed for a year or longer, like, we really do not need that data to be immediately accessible, and we want to automatically move it down to the archive access or the deep archive access tier. And we launched um, event notifications for archive events because many of our media and entertainment customers told us we manage databases that have to be aware which objects are immediately accessible and which ones are not. And now we're launching the archive instant access tier because many of our customers told us we have petabytes of data that need to be immediately accessible when they are needed. So I want to leave you with a couple of cu customer stories. So the first one is from Stripe, which is a technology company for payments that, that is used by startup customers and enterprise scale customers across the globe. One of the things that really calls the attention to me in this particular quote is that Stripe was able to, to save 30% month over month storage cost savings without absolutely no impact on performance. And some of us might be familiar with Epic Games, especially if, you, if you've played uh, Fortnite before. <laughs> Fortnite is a very popular game that is, has been played by 400 million uh, users across the globe. So here, in this particular story, Fortnite talks about the importance of no servants and interruptions, and not only that, reducing the operational overhead helping them allocate their time and other activities that add value to their business. And this particular quote from, uh, from Capital One, it, it, it's a story that resonates with a lot of our customers. I talk to a lot of customers that tell me, I have many buckets that have very diverse uh, data access patterns, and there's no single, there's no single bullet for me to uh, optimize every single bucket in my account. And intelligent, with intelligent tiering, Capital One was able to optimize across many buckets without any additional oper operational overhead, without having to analyze and fine tune different lifecycle configurations across their environment. So next, I wanna talk a little bit more about defining your archiving strategy and really getting the, the most savings for data that does not need to be immediately accessible and is not accessed for a very long period of time. One of, the, one of the things that Andrew talked about was the amount of growth that we're seeing in, uh, across every single customer. Data is growing at an, unprecedented, at an unprecedented, unprecedented pace. And we see customers doubling and tripling their data in, in petabyte scale more and more every single year. And with that growth, you have to be very conscious about your storage cost. Just because your data storage is growing does not mean that your storage costs have to grow at the same rate. So what do we do? We need, to, we need to define an archiving strategy that fits our needs. With the recent launch of the Glacier Instant uh, Retrieval Storage class, when we look at across our portfolio of Glacier storage classes, you can now optimize cost and performance across rarely accessed data for data that needs immediate access. And with the S3 Glacier flexible retrieval, uh, if you have to retrieve large amounts of data at no cost, you can, you can use S3 Glacier flexible retrieval. And if you want to get the lowest storage cost in the cloud, S3 Glacier Deep Archive is the ideal storage class for you. And for data with changing access patterns, 
where you don't know necessarily what the right time is when a data is not accessed anymore, you can use S3 intelligent tiering to automatically optimize storage cost. Let's talk more about each of the Glacier storage classes. For objects that you know are cold and ingest, such as financial records that you need to store for compliance reasons in the case that there's an audit or data that you know will be rarely accessed for the foreseeable future, you can choose from three S3 Glacier storage classes. For archive data that needs immediate access, such as medical images, media assets, or broadcasting, you should use the S3 Glacier instant retrieval storage class. And for archive data that does not need immediate access, but needs the flexibility to retrieve large data sets at no cost, you should use S3 Glacier Flexible Retrieval. One of the things that I want to emphasize with the, new, with the S3 Glacier Flexible Retrieval is that we cut storage prices by 10%, so it's now 10% uh, lower cost, and in addition, there, there are free bulk retrievals, which is really ideal for your backup use cases. And to get the lowest storage cost in the cloud, you should use S3 uh, Glacier Deep Archive for data that you can access within hours. Another announcement that I want to highlight in that you should be thinking about in combination with your archiving strategy is some changes that we made to our S3 lifecycle uh, configurations. Now, S3 lifecycle supports filters based on the size of objects and as well as the number of non-current versions. So for example, we have a lot of media customers that want to specify a rule to only archive uh, media assets to S3 Glacier Flexible Retrieval or S3 Glacier Deep Archive that, that are, say, larger than 10 megabytes in size. This is really allowing you to optimize your lifecycle transition cost when you're ready to archive different data sets. And what if you have data with unknown or changing access patterns? Well, in this, in this situation, you would use S3 Intelligent Tiering to automatically archive data to the archive access and the deep archive access that hasn't been accessed for a long period of time. To recap, we built the asynchronous access tiers within the Intelligent Tiering Storage class because many of our customers didn't want to track for long periods of time what subsets of data are not accessed for, say, longer than a year or longer than six months, and you know, depending on their d different application needs. And with intelligent tiering, you can configure rules within the, the intelligent tiering storage class to automatically archive uh, data after up to, up to two years of no access. A common use case that I see a lot for the archive access and the deep archive access tier our different uh, analytics data sets within an organization that are used by data scientists and business analysts. So a lot of the times, uh, different business analysts will look at more frequent data on a week-over-week -week basis. But data from five years ago or 10 years ago is probably safe to say that it's not being actively worked on. For these data sets, they don't need to be immediately retrievable, and we're usually okay waiting a day or a couple of hours to get that data back. What if you, and if you need immediate access, if you, if you need immediate access for rarely accessed data, you don't need to use the archive instant, the archive access tier, sorry. Uh, you can choose to enable the archive, you can choose to enable a deep archive access only and for data that hasn't been accessed for say longer than a year. So we talked about this, but one of the things to highlight here is that you have the flexibility to configure your ideal archiving strategy within the Intelligent Tiering Storage class. The data will, be will move to the archive access tier for a minimum of 90 days or a minimum of 180 days to the deep archive access tier, but you also have the ability to extend that up to two years. And one of the things that I want to call attention to is that many of our customers that are asking for, um, that have media and, and entertainment workflows, they update their database uh, to know what, what media assets are immediately accessible. You can now enable event notifications whenever objects are automatically archived into the archive access tier or the deep archive access tier and not immediately accessible. 
So with the rapid growth of data, you want to implement an, an archive strategy that supports your future growth. To recap, for rarely accessed data that needs millisecond retrieval, you would use the S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval Storage class. For data that has changing access patterns and you want to archive based on the last access of your objects, you would use S3 uh, Intelligent Tiering. And for backup use cases that need the highest flexibility, uh, when, whenever you need to retrieve data at no cost, you would use S3 Glacier Flexible Retrieval. And to get the lowest storage cost, for your compliance and backup data, you would use Glacier Deep Archive. Next, I'm going to pass on the mic to Srini Bovas, who will talk to us how, the, how Splunk uses Amazon S3 to turn data into, into insights. Thanks, Jesse. How are you folks doing? Hello, everyone. I'm Srinivas Boba. I'm a product manager in the Splunk data platform. Today, I'm super excited to share all the details about how Splunk uses AWS S3 to optimize cost by decoupling storage and compute, and also get actionable insights out of their data. Uh, before I go into deep dive into how we AWS S3 is used by Splunk, I do want to share a little bit details about an overview of Splunk. Any customers of Splunk here? Raise of hands. Wow. Great news. So what is Splunk? Splunk is a global leader in log analytics, which allows you to index machine data and analyze those data to get actionable insights. So what does that really mean, right? That means the data insights will help you to improve service levels, reduce cost, mitigate threats, and deepen customer understanding. So the key aspect I do want to call out here is really Splunk is one big data platform where you can ingest all your log data and get insights out of it. So one of the key call out I do want to make sure here is that, as you can see here, right, Splunk allows you to reduce risk by 70% in the security aspects and helps with your observability by 90%, accelerate your development and reduce your um, DevOps time to really uh, iterate on your delivering the features to your customers. And it also helps reduce your IT operation by 82%. So this is one of the key aspects of Splunk. So now let, let me talk briefly uh, about how Splunk uses Amazon S3 to turn data into insights. Before I deep dive into this, uh, let me quickly talk about one of the first aspects, right? Uh, customers are generating tons of data with rapid di digital transformation and cloud migration. Customers are generating more data than you ever imagine. And this is compounded by the pandemic and the COVID where customers are generating more data in one year than combined of the last 10 years. But the key aspect here is how do you generate insights of the, this data? That means you need to store large amounts of data for 90 days, 180 days, or even sometimes years of data. But storing data is kind of expensive at some point of the time. But uh, the biggest aspect of what we did with Splunk is really decoupled storage with compute. And that's where the, ASD, uh, uh, sorry, the S3 aspect comes into picture, where we, S3 was really helping us to decouple that storage and compute. And the cost savings we are seeing our customers are around 70%. So that's a big, big uh, impact AWS S3 had on this particular architecture. I'll talk about the architecture details in the next slides. And just to give you a perspective of how much data we store, right? This is, uh, we store more than 200 petabytes of data. This is all customer data in Splunk Cloud, which is essentially managed uh, uh, in the backend by AWS S3. And if you look at the data patterns, right, we almost search around more than tens of millions of searches per day with different access patterns. That includes ad, ad hoc searches, scheduled searches, so you are doing rare searches, dense searches, or also nearly linear stack searches. And if you look at the use cases, right, there are a wide ranging of use cases. We solve use cases for financial sector, industry sector, manufacturing sector, public sectors, bunch of areas. If you look at the spectrum of use cases, we solve from all the way from solving a simple needle in a stack scenario to searching through millions of records of data. So uh, let me briefly talk about uh, the Splunk architecture. 
before smart store and after smart store. The reason uh, why we want to call smart store is smart store is what is based on the S3 model. So as you can see on the left hand side, the architecture, that's the classic architecture without the uh, smart store, which where we don't use S3. So you can see as we have three types of data classes, what we call as hot, cold, and warm. So there is a data transition that happens between the hot and warm and cold. Hot data refers to the data which is the most frequently accessed data and latest data which has been ingested. You can think of that data as the last 30 days data. And warm data is what data ages into out. After some time, if we are not using that data, that's where we call it as a warm data. And that's also is kind of stored in the local indexes. And the final stage of data is what we call as a cold data, which is essentially a aged data. So currently, in the classic architecture, what we do is like we have the hot data and the warm data in the local indexes and necessity, but the cold data is actually moved out into an external storage. But as you can see on the right side of the smart store, a new architecture, we are kind of decoupled that whole storage mechanism and compute mechanism, right? So we still store the hard data in the local SSDs, which is essentially what we call as the indexers. But the hard data is actually kind of moved to remote storage called S3 here. And there's no concept of cold because the storage is so cheap in S3, you can put all your data there. So that's the biggest change in uh, the classic architecture to the smart store architecture, where we are leveraging S3 to decouple the compute and the storage. Uh, let me spend a little bit of time in how does the data flow work, right? As you can see on this particular diagram, uh, on the left-hand side, we have the data which is coming in. We store the data in what we call an indexer. An indexer has the local storage, which is an SSD or, or, or sometimes an NVM cache. And we store the latest data there. And then uh, data is also replicated to a clustered index for fault tolerance. And once the data, um, that data is re currently resides in the local storage. But after data ages out, what we call it as moving from hot to warm, the data move, moves into what we call um, the remote storage, which is Amazon S3. That's how we are able to store large amounts of data. So customers can store like data from, uh, from 30 days to two years. On the right hand side, you can see the search flow. Searcher is a place where the customer initiates the search. And the search first thing it does is it like goes and searches the data in the local cache. If the data is not available in the local cache, what we call a cache miss, the, then we go back to uh, S3 and download that data. So as you can see clearly here is that we are able to decouple the compute and storage and enable us to store large amounts of data and provide insights to customers on an on a ad hoc basis or a scheduled basis, however they want. So this really helps us, uh, a lot of our customers, um, storing data for 90 days to almost like a two plus years of data. So I do want to also quickly talk about the different data life cycles we have in Splunk Cloud Platform. As you can see, the data is coming into the what we call as the hot data, which kind of stores in the local indexers in SSD, and that uh, as data ages into what we call as the warm data, you kind of move it into the S3 uh, standard storage. But we have also other use cases where customers want to move their uh, data into archive, and that's where we kind of move into what we call the DDA, dynamic data auto archive. Essentially, we are moving the data into Glacier. So we have two flavors of this particular DDA. One we call it as uh, the Splunk Managed, where Splunk manages this whole of these buckets and provides you a capability to retrieve this data seamlessly into the standard format from Glacier to standard. And we also have what we call DDSS, dynamic data self-storage, where customer manages the bucket and you can, it's also stored in what we call as a Glacier storage class. So as you can clearly see here, like the AWS S3 different storage classes are providing us the capability to move the data across different life cycles. So now just to summarize all the things we just talked about, right? Um, S3 together with our smart store really helps us decouple storage and compute. So what does this really means for customers, right? They can store large amounts of data. They don't have to care about how much data they're storing. They can decouple the whole compute aspect with the storage aspect. And uh, Looking at the second one, you can see right uh, the S3 intelligent tiering really helps us with the different changing access pattern. As I called out, we have customers searching and doing ad hoc searches and uh, scheduled searches, looking at the last 30 days data, looking at last large volumes of data like dense searches and uh, sparse searches. All that is possible with the uh, current S3 uh, storage uh, and intelligent tier access patterns. And thirdly, for compliance and data retention, we use S3 storage and Glacier classes. This helps us with data ma management lifecycle. With the new introduction of the Glacier uh, capabilities, this is something we'll be exploring more. 
but definitely very excited about the new features we are launching here. And finally, the biggest one, which is really what is helping us customers is benefiting on the low cost. All the savings are being passed to the customer, so customer can spend their time and um, money in other places where to innovate their customers. And this also helps Splunk to really focus on launching new features without worrying about the storage aspects of it. So overall, Splunk's smart store together with AWS S3 is really helping customers to uh, ingest and store large amounts of data and get data insights into an actionable uh, scenarios. Thank you all for taking the time to join. I'll now I'll pass it over to Andrew and uh, Jesse. Ooh, Shrini. Um, that's it for today's session. Again, thanks everyone for, for coming today. Uh, we'll do Q&A just off stage over here. Again, thank you.